Good day, everyone, and welcome to the GDF Suez Energy Resources MISO Amari Market Update New Resource Adequacy Issues Conference Call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn things over to Mr. David Braun. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning. This is David Braun. I'm the Regional Vice President of Sales for the Midwest for GDF Suez. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the GDF Suez Energy Resources webinar. Um, Midwest ISO slash AMRIN market update with speakers Scott Fotre, Karen Dietz, and myself. Scott is the regional sales manager for GDF Suez for the AMRIN area, and Karen is our manager of supply. We will conclude the webinar with a question and answer session. Please note that today's web conference is being recorded. We have a diverse audience in this webinar session. Participants include energy buyers from small businesses all the way up to Fortune 100 companies. Additionally, we have many third-party consultants and brokers on the line with us today. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that throughout the presentation, we invite you to submit your questions via the online system. To ask a presenter a question about the presentation using the ON24 console, click on the Ask a Question window. Type your question and click, submit, uh, click the Submit button, and your question will be placed into the queue. We'll address the questions at the end of the program as time permits. You may download the slides at any time by clicking Download the Presentation button at the bottom of the screen. Also, a link to the recorded presentation will be sent to you via the email later, uh, via the email after the webinar, and we'll also be posting it onto our website. If you are having technical difficulties with today's presentation, please select the Help button at the bottom of the screen for an event help guide. Uh, and with that, we will uh, we'll now begin. Please uh, move to the next slide. Okay. The, uh, the first slide uh, actually is a statement that uh, our, our lawyers ask us to put up that just describes that uh, we're, we may be making some forward-looking statements or projections. Uh, this might be identified by words such as uh, anticipates, projects, expects, uh, potential, plans, intends, believes, estimates, and targets. Um, this, is, this presentation is intended to outline general information and is for informational purposes only. It is not an invitation or offering to subscribe or otherwise acquire or dispose of any shares or other securities of GDF Suez or international power. Uh, moving on to the agenda slide. Moving on to the agenda slide. Um, today's agenda, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about GDF Suez uh, initially and then uh, move into a discussion of the Midwest ISO, uh, its market design, and sp some specifics about the Ameren service territory and information about, uh, about uh, historic uh, forward pricing and, uh, and market data. Uh, we'll also then talk uh, quite a bit about capacity market changes that are coming up in the near term, uh, including the resource adequacy enhancements that are going to be put in place by MISO uh, in June 2013. And then briefly with the discussion of transmission and ancillaries and then move, and risk uh, management and product structures in the retail market, and then move on to question and answers. So moving to the next slide, just a quick, uh, 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 quick slide and a commercial for who GDF uh, Energy Resources is. Uh, sometimes I like to say we're, we're the biggest company that no one's heard of. Uh, we serve over 83,000 commercial, industrial, and institutional accounts. In, uh, in deregulated markets in the U.S. And you can see a map of the markets there on the slide. Uh, total uh, U.S. retail load is in excess of, of 8,000 megawatts. But uh, just as importantly, in North America, GDF Suez is also uh, one of the top 10 largest power generators in the country with about 14,000 megawatts of power generation. So you can see that uh, our generation asset base is uh, uh, quite in excess of handling the retail load that, that we serve. Um, and also included in our generation asset base is, uh, is 5,000, I'm sorry, 500 megawatts of re renewable power generation, which includes uh, wind, solar, and biomass in various parts of the country, uh, as well as hydro. And it doesn't even include uh, a couple of thousand megawatts we have of pumped hydro water storage uh, capabilities 
uh, in the Northeast. Here in Illinois, we've got about 325 megawatts of generation that is primarily gas-fired, but uh, also a, a bit of coal. Uh, globally, uh, we're proud to be a member of the GDS, GDF Suez group of companies, which is a global leader in utilities and independent power production with over $126 billion in revenue last year. Uh, we're also ranked very high on many of the surveys in terms of uh, most admired companies, uh, sustainability surveys and things like that. And we enjoy an A uh, credit rating by S&P, which is one of the highest in the industry. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Fotre, who is our uh, regional sales manager for the uh, southern Illinois part of our, our territory. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the GDF Suez Energy Resources MISO Amari Market Update New Resource Adequacy Issues Conference Call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn things over to Mr. David Braun. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning. This is David Braun. I'm the Regional Vice President of Sales for the Midwest for GDF Suez. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the GDF Suez Energy Resources webinar. Um, Midwest ISO slash AMRIN market update with speakers Scott Fotre, Karen Dietz, and myself. Scott is the regional sales manager for GDF Suez for the AMRIN area, and Karen is our manager of supply. We will conclude the webinar with a question and answer session. Please note that today's web conference is being recorded. We have a diverse audience in this webinar session. Participants include energy buyers from small businesses all the way up to Fortune 100 companies. Additionally, we have many third-party consultants and brokers on the line with us today. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that throughout the presentation, we invite you to submit your questions via the online system. To ask a presenter a question about the presentation using the ON24 console, click on the Ask a Question window. Type your question and click, submit, uh, click the Submit button, and your question will be placed into the queue. We'll address the questions at the end of the program as time permits. You may download the slides at any time by clicking Download the Presentation button at the bottom of the screen. Also, a link to the recorded presentation will be sent to you via the email later, uh, via the email after the webinar, and we'll also be posting it onto our website. If you are having technical difficulties with today's presentation, please select the Help button at the bottom of the screen for an event help guide. Uh, and with that, we will uh, we'll now begin. Please uh, move to the next slide. Okay. The, uh, the first slide uh, actually is a statement that uh, our, our lawyers ask us to put up that just describes that uh, we're, we may be making some forward-looking statements or projections. Uh, this might be identified by words such as uh, anticipates, projects, expects, uh, potential, plans, intends, believes, estimates, and targets. Um, this, is, this presentation is intended to outline general information and is for informational purposes only. It is not an invitation or offering to subscribe or otherwise acquire or dispose of any shares or other securities of GDF Suez or international power. Uh, moving on to the agenda slide. Moving on to the agenda slide. Um, Today's agenda, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about GDF Suez uh, initially, and then uh, move into a discussion of the Midwest ISO, uh, its market design, and sp some specifics about the Ameren Service Territory and information about uh, about uh, historic uh, forward pricing and uh, and market data. Uh, we'll also then talk uh, quite a bit about capacity market changes that are coming up in the near term. Uh, including the resource adequacy enhancements that are going to be put in place by MISO uh, in June 2013. And then briefly with the discussion of transmission and ancillaries and then move, and risk uh, management and product structures in the retail market, and then move on to question and answers. So moving to the next slide, just a quick, uh, 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 quick slide and a commercial for who GDF uh, Energy Resources is. Uh, sometimes I like to say we're, we're the biggest company that no one's heard of. Uh, 
we serve over 83,000 commercial, industrial, and institutional accounts in, uh, in deregulated markets in the U.S. And you can see a map of the markets there on the slide. Uh, total uh, U.S. retail load is in excess of, of 8,000 megawatts. But uh, just as importantly, in North America, GDF Suez is also uh, one of the top 10 largest power generators in the country with about 14,000 megawatts of power generation. So you can see that uh, our generation asset base is uh, uh, quite in excess of handling the retail load that, that we serve. Um, and also included in our generation asset base is, uh, is 5,000, I'm sorry, 500 megawatts of re renewable power generation, which includes uh, wind, solar, and biomass in various parts of the country, uh, as well as hydro. And it doesn't even include uh, a couple of thousand megawatts we have of pumped hydro water storage uh, capabilities uh, in the Northeast. Here in Illinois, we've got about 325 megawatts of generation that is primarily gas-fired, but uh, also a, a bit of coal. Uh, globally, uh, we're proud to be a member of the GDS, GDF Suez Group of Companies, which is a global leader in utilities and independent power production with over $126 billion in revenue last year. Uh, we're also ranked very high on many of the surveys in terms of uh, most admired companies, uh, sustainability surveys and things like that. And we enjoy an A uh, credit rating by S&P, which is one of the highest in the industry. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Fotre, who is our uh, regional sales manager for the uh, southern Illinois part of our, our territory. And he's going to talk about the Midwest ISO and some of the uh, cost and uh, product structures here in the state. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. Uh, the Midwest ISO, ISO. Uh, they're the grid operator for a number of states, uh, Michigan, parts of Indiana, Illinois, parts of Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, and even parts of Manitoba, Canada. Um, MISO is tasked with maintaining and managing grid reliability and the economic dispatch of generation. With running markets for energy uh, in the realms of financial transmission rights auctions, day ahead, real-time and ancillary uh, service markets. The primary function is to operate bulk, uh, the bulk transmission grid in a reliable and efficient manner. Next slide, please. So the Ammon Service Territory, a little bit about that. It covers approximately three-quarters of the state of Illinois and is, is three, has three integrated zones. Uh, the integrated zones are from three former utilities, and the former utilities are Central Illinois Public Service, Central Illinois Light Company, and Illinois Power. And despite the integration, the Ameren zones have slightly different default service prices for the fixed price customers. And as you can see by the map, uh, they're highlighted in uh, uh, where they are in the state. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the purpose of this slide is to help our customers understand electricity purchases from a pricing and uh, risk management perspective. The pyramid graphic defines supplier cost or load serving uh, existing cost. Uh, as you can see from the bottom of the pyramid, the largest part, uh, it goes upwards uh, to indicate uh, the, the volatility of each one of the, uh, the cost included in the pyramid. So at the bottom we have the energy costs, which, which are approximately 84 percent of the cost. They have the most uh, volatility, but they are indeed the most manageable. Uh, these costs, these energy costs, do include uh, congestion and line losses. Moving upwards, we see the transmission delivery costs, uh, which include capacity, ancillary services, and transmission costs. Again, each one, um, uh, each one of these is less manageable, but then again, they are tariff. They are based on tariff rates. So, um, next slide, please. Starting with the largest and most uh, volatile component, energy, at the bottom of the pyramid, um, the energy uh, includes components such as uh, hub energy, zonal basis, shape, straddle, imbalance, and losses. The, these are the costs incurred by supplier, uh, by I'm sorry, incurred by suppliers to follow customers' load fluctuations, okay, and they are hedgeable. Next slide, please. The energy markets, they consist of day ahead and real time. 
Um, the day uh, energy suppliers have uh, are are have CP nodes assigned uh, for their customers or or, enter, or for themselves, and uh, customers can have their own CP node uh, provide provided to them. Uh, as this relates to uh, custom calculations for LMPs and ancillaries. Okay. This isn't unique in the MISO territory, uh, the concept of a CP node. <clears throat> uh, would you like to add anything at this point? Sure, yeah, let's just jump in for a second on the, on the CP node. So, so MISO is running day ahead in, in uh, real-time energy markets uh, to set LMP prices, but uh, Basically, uh, complexity in, in MISO is that all of the suppliers, including the utilities, have what are called CP nodes or commercial pricing nodes, where the uh, the LMPs are custom priced based on on uh, the delivery points for the customers that that, that supplier is serving. Uh, so the LM, the locational marginal prices, which are the hourly prices, as well as uh, ancillary uh, ancillary services, are calculated on a custom basis for uh, for each of each of the CP nodes, uh, which uh, typically represent a supplier. Uh, but can also be an individual customer. So there's a handful of customers in the market that have their own CP nodes, which represent uh, a custom calculation of LMPs and ancillaries and other charges at that particular customer's location. So uh, th those customers out there that, that have a CP node know it uh, because they would have had to go through quite a bit of paperwork with the uh, with MISO and Ameren to set that up. But if, if you do have one, uh, make sure that as you're going out to bed that you're, you're discussing that with potential suppliers so they understand uh, that you do have your own custom CP node and uh, they, they, they are properly pricing it to, to work with you on, on those costs. And, and as David mentioned, there are very few customer uh, CP nodes. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. So what does move energy cost? Okay. Uh, relative volatility of our pricing uh, of the index rate um, you know, as far as pricing, uh, before January of this year was from the Synergy hub, but with the purchase of Synergy by Duke uh, in Ohio, the, the hub moved to PJM. Uh, the new, new pricing now is from the Indiana hub, which is the most liquid trading point for MISO. Uh, I think the, the point here is to is shown on the graph that, that up until uh, or starting with the beginning of January, uh, we see that that even though the the hourly rate uh, did fluctuate uh, quite high and hit uh, you know a 25 cent per kWh mark for an hour or two, it still is fairly reasonable and and, and averages uh, somewhere around 3.6 cents a kilowatt hour for a one time frame. 3.16. 3.16 cents a kilowatt hour. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. As far as the correlation between natural gas and power, uh, definitely correlation because peak generation is typically gas fired, and and this can be shown based or it can be seen on the graph uh, that uh, that power prices and gas prices do do correlate nicely uh, uh, and have come down nicely uh, since beginning of the year with uh, with the market fluctuations. Next slide, please. This slide depicts uh, the NYMEX um, uh, perspective of Henry Hub, Henry Hub forward strips um, and shows us a sense of future gas prices. Uh, you can see that Cantago, the Cantago nature of the market for Cal 13, 14, and 15, uh, uh, as the market has come down substantially and remains relatively low at this time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Again, looking at the forward curves for power pricing from the Indiana hub. Uh, and as you can see, electricity uh, from that hub uh, does show, again, a cantango nature of the market for, for Cal 13, 14, and 15. And, and the idea behind this, this information is to, is to show uh, our customers how to get away from the potential uncertainty of, of hourly or in uh, pricing, and that these uh, definitely are hedgeable, and and uh, forward pricing can be can be looked at uh, to fix prices for customers uh, in, in for future dates. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about the Midwest ISO market. 
Um, this, this, uh, this particular slide, uh, you, we can view this in two halves. Uh, the top half is, is a uh, is MISO footprint and a color-based representation of prices throughout the MISO territory. And right now, they're, you can, as you can see, they're running in the, the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, the bottom portion of the, the slide is, is, uh, is a historical representation of the MISO market and uh, available on our website. And don't worry about this, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have this presentation posted on the GDF Suez uh, website, so, so we'll, we'll have those links available to you later. Um, the idea here is to be able to look at a particular uh, area within the Ameren market to see what, uh, what has happened in, in the past. So yeah, on our website we, we post, and we do this for all the, the ISOs that we serve uh, and all the utility zones that we serve, uh, you can go to that website and download historic uh, day ahead and real time hourly prices as well as monthly and weekly averages uh, for all the zones that we serve. So it's a pretty slick uh, tool to be able to download, uh, uh, download that data and use it in, in pricing analysis. So. Uh, basically, I think you know the gist of, of, of the energy portion that we wanted to discuss today is uh, prices continue to remain uh, relatively low. Uh, we do see a lot of customers in the Ameren territory that continue to uh, uh, to go on index pricing. They found that to be pretty favorable. As, as uh, Scott mentioned, it's about 3.1 cents a kilowatt hour on average so far this year. Uh, but uh, you know the market for for futures, uh, both on the gas and and, and the power uh, forward markets uh, still remain relatively low historically and uh, are in a good, you know, pretty good position right now to hedge if customers want to get some, some more price certainty on the energy side. And we'll talk about products in a few minutes and, and how, uh, what product options customers would have uh, for, for the energy uh, portion of the load. Uh, we're going to turn this over now on the next slide to, uh, to talk about capacity. Um, and we'll be turning uh, the presentation now over to Karen Dietz, who's our uh, supply manager for the Midwest mm -hmm. ISO territory. So her, she's got the responsibility for, uh, for hedging as well as setting our, our, our price curves and managing our book in that territory. So is our resident expert on all things MISO. So Karen, uh, we turn it over to you. All right, thanks David. Um, on this page 15, uh, it's the next level in our energy py or our cost pyramid. Um, is capacity. Right now we have it marked at about 5% of the total cost. Right now the, the cost of capacity has been extremely low and although not expected to, to jump, uh, there's changes coming into the, the MISO capacity market. Um, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so before we talk about the changes that are occurring in MISO's resource adequacy concept, Let's talk about what capacity is in MISO for a minute. Similar to the other markets, such as PJM, MISO has a capacity market. And although the construct works quite differently, the purpose of the capacity market is very similar. Capacity can be thought of as a payment to the generation to ensure that the unit is available to the market. It's also an additional source of revenue for the generators, in addition to the energy and ancillary services market. It, in theory, provides a contribution to the fixed costs that the generators have for having steel in the ground. MISO's primary reason for the capacity market is to ensure, that the real, to ensure the reliability of the grid by, by maintaining an adequate reserve margin. When MISO discusses their, concept, uh, their capacity market, they generally refer to the resource adequacy construct. And over the past two years, MISO has been working on enhancements to this resource adequacy con uh, construct to comply with FERC's order from June 2010. Next slide. In order to understand what's changing, we're going to briefly go over how the current resource adequacy construct works. Right now, the capacity obligations are established monthly and at the LSE level. So it's at your supplier's, your supplier's level. The obligation for each LSE is based on that LSE's total forecasted peak demand for each month. This means that the value uh, will vary month to month and among the different suppliers. And although MISO holds a monthly voluntary capacity auction, capacity is primarily traded bilaterally in the wholesale market. This traded product is a market-wide product, so the location of the generator doesn't really come into play right now. Next slide. 
Now, in order to comply with the FERC order, MISO is currently undergoing changes to their construct. And while, while the points which I'm about to cover will take effect for the 2013-2014 uh, the, the planning year, starting in June, I want to point out that MISO still has filings at, at FERC regarding this construct, especially with the re handling of re the retail choice, such as Ameren. At a high level, the enhancements to MISO's resource adequacy construct will standardize the capacity obligations for retail customers in Ameren. In Ameren, they, they will be implementing PLCs at an account level. This PLC will represent your contribution to Ameren's peak load from the past summer. Your PLC will remain constant for a single planning year, June through May, and it will not change regardless of your supplier. In addition to standardizing the obligation, MISO will be implementing an annual resource planning auction. We'll go over the timeline shortly, but the auction will occur in April and it'll establish a default price uh, for the prompt year's capacity. Unlike PGM, there will not be a forward capacity market at this time, or a forward capacity market auction at this time. In addition to the annual auction, it's expected that the bilateral market will continue to exist. This bilateral market will allow suppliers uh, to fix capacity beyond the single planning year. One more thing to note is that the new construct will create a zonal concept. In theory, this will allow for price signals to indicate where additional capacity is needed. Okay. So right now we're going to discuss how the cost of capacity is calculated in the future. As mentioned earlier, each meter will be assigned a unique PLC based on Ameren's coincident peak from the previous summer. Your obligation will be this PLC, including losses in the planning reserve margin. However, right now it's unclear whether the PLCs will, as provided by Ameren will include the losses in the planning reserve margin. This should be clarified by when FERC responds to MISO's September 28th filing. However, knowing your obligation will include the losses in planning reserve margin, you would multiply the obligation by the auction clearing price at the local resource zone, and then by the number of days in the billing cycle. This calculation de describes the cost calculated for the auction clearing price, but it is possible to satisfy your obligations through, an, uh, uh, through the annual auction as well as through purchasing capacity in the bilateral market. It's worth noting since the PLCs and the, the auction clearing price are only fixed for the individual planning year, Fixed capacity products, which will exceed the term of your, the current planning year, should be able to be fixed by estimation of future PLCs, losses, planning reserve margins, and the cost of the zonal capacity in the bilateral market. Next slide. And finally, let's just go over the, the timeline um, and building up to the, when the auction will take place. So the, the results and the implementation of the settlement of the, the planning reserve margin will take effect June 1st, um, but there's a couple of different steps that, that happen before that happens. On November 1st, Ameren provided their load forecast for their entire area, which is used to help set the, the capacity requirement for their territory. Also, on, by November 1st, it, MISO finished their loss of load study and set the planning reserve margin at 6.2%. Then recently, around November 5th, Ameren provided their retail suppliers with preliminary PLCs. These values include estimated transmission losses but do not include the PRM. Ameren wanted to note that the, the estimated losses will, will change but they, they shouldn't be significant. So right now your suppliers likely have the, the PLCs that will be used um, for next year. Then on December 15th and January 15th, your current supplier will receive the PLCs that should be used in your obligation. However, this exact number, the exact number will only be provided directly to MISO and to your supplier. Then moving on to March 15th, MISO will complete their review of Ameren's load forecast. And if MISO finds no problems, with Ameren's forecast methodology, then the PLCs that were provided to the supplier on December or January will be used for the, your obligation. However, there is a small chance that MISO may find fault with Ameren's forecast methodology 
and those PLCs may um, change by March, um, but this is a small possibility. Then on March 27th, the auction window opens and the clearing price will be available on April 5th. So by April 5th or early April, you'll have everything to know um, the cost and the obligation for the, the June 13 to May 14 planning year. Next slide. And now I, we're going to go back to Scott to talk about transmission. Thanks, Karen. So back to the energy cost pyramid, um, um, transmission cost at the top of the pyramid with a low volatility is, is uh, again, a delivery component. It is a tariff rate. It, it, uh, it, it is approximately 8% of the cost from your supplier. And uh, what it is, it's the, what the supplier pays for energy transmission to cover a customer's peak as they fluctuate every month. Unlike PGM, uh, uh, tag, uh, the tag concept um, is not being utilized. Okay? Uh, and, and if you recall, the tag, the tag concept set that, uh, set that peak for a one-year period. Um, cost of, uh, uh, the transmission cost is a cost to move power across the grid, and, and it adds risk to the supplier costs. Uh, again, it is a tariff, uh, it's tariff rate, so the tariff changes occur typically in January and June of every year. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to ancillary costs. Again, low volatility, consisting of about 3% of the supplier costs. And this includes all the other items MISO must do to keep electricity flowing and, and maintain reliability. And to name a few, uh, some, of the, some of the things that are included in, in ancillary services are voltage and frequency regulation, spinning reserve, and, uh, and RPS charges. Next slide, please. Um, moving on to uh, RPS. Um, these are additional costs in Illinois and uh, RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard. Uh, it is procurement of a percentage of a supply uh, for, from renewable resources, or renewable sources rather. Currently it's at 7% and it's growing to 8% starting in June of next year, and with the requirement growing to 25% by 2025. Keep in mind this will begin to include solar requirements starting in June of 2015. So, uh, Basically, at least 50% of the, of the RPS requirement has to be procured from the Illinois uh, Power Authority at rate set. It sets annually through an auction process. Um, these rates uh, currently, um, currently we're looking at uh, a compliance payment of approximately 63 cents uh, per megawatt hour for the current period between June 1st of this year through May of uh, next year, and. Uh, we believe the, bend, uh, the blended basis uh, we are passing through approximately is 35 cents per megawatt hour in, uh, for Hammer and RPS. Next slide, please. System support resources, or, or SSR. This is the generation deactivation in MISO. Uh, these are charges resulting from generators proposed for retirement that must remain running for reliability purposes. Uh, as you know, in MISO, there is a lot of older coal-fired generation in service, and future retirements could lead to SSR charges. Currently, there are no SSR charges in, in, uh, in the Ameren service territory. But uh, just as a side note, uh, there was recent uh, 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 charges, SSR charges, for 22 megawatt, uh, a 22-megawatt plant in Escanaba, Michigan, and we believe that uh, this will... Uh, uh, have charges being applied to customers in the UP and northern Wisconsin. So the takeaway from this is to be careful to understand how SSR charges may apply to retail contracts. Right. We uh, just jump in on that. Uh, you know, so far in, in Midwest ISO, there's only been one, this one incident here in, in Escanaba that just came up recently that uh, uh, will apply uh, SSR charges uh, resulting from a proposed deactivation of a power plant. but Given all of the coal-fired generation that exists in Ameren and the fact that a lot of it, it's, uh, it's, it's getting pretty old and outdated, uh, and with current EPA regulations and, and probably some tightening regulations with uh, 
uh, you know, second term Obama EPA, uh, you know, with us for the next four years. I, I would expect to see some more coal-fired retirements coming up in uh, in MISO's territory, and some of that, some of those retirements could eventually lead to having some SSR charges applying in Ameren and uh, other uh, non-regulated markets like uh, or restructured markets like Michigan. So, something to note. Uh, Case in point was uh, in, in PJM, uh, they, they've had quite a few retirements, uh, charges as high as $1.75 uh, per megawatt hour applying out in, in Philadelphia. Uh, recently, uh, uh, due to retirements in Ohio, we're, we're going to be seeing some uh, uh, similar charges uh, applying in Cleveland and the other uh, first energy utility markets in Ohio. So. Um, it's out there, it's something to think about, it's something to make sure that you understand how your retail supplier is going to address. I've heard a lot of them say, oh, yeah, it's included, don't worry, uh, only to find that what they included was zero. And when the charge actually uh, incurred, they said, oh, this is a change in law, therefore we're going to charge it to you. So be very careful and understand how, how that's being assessed. Uh, we just make it a pass-through. We don't try to guess where they're going to be or what they're going to be. but. Uh, just uh, notify our customers that in, if one ever were to crop up, we're going to uh, uh, pass through what, what the actual charge is on that and not try to make any estimates or fix them or put on risk premiums to our customers to try to cover something that, frankly, no supplier can, uh, can estimate. So I just want to give some, uh, some background on, on, that, uh, on that piece. So uh, Moving on to the next slide, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about product and product choices here. Uh, First, uh, just laying the groundwork on product selection, uh, the slide you see here is a, a graphic that we generated uh, at GDF Suez to kind of demonstrate to customers the range of outputs and help them uh, understand uh, product selection Im implications. The colored part of this uh, graphic uh, shows basically a range of outcomes, and on the left, range of outcomes in terms of energy cost. Uh, on the left side of this, uh, this, this graphic, the blue part, uh, you see some very small waves uh, on the lines in there. Uh, what we're trying to depict there is a very narrow range of outcomes uh, for cost and not very much cost volatility. And over to the right uh, in the red zone, much greater volatility, much wider potential outcome for, for budgetary costs. And then that dotted line going from the bottom right to the upper left is, is meant to represent risk premiums. The farther you get to the left of this graph and try to get to a, a narrower band of outcomes or more certain outcome, the more you're going to pay a supplier for risk premiums. Uh, conversely, to the right end of that spectrum is uh, uh, very low risk premiums being paid, but uh, customer uh, subject to floating with, uh, with the market costs, uh, energy capacity, uh, and all the ancillaries, et cetera. And another thing I will note on here is that the, the tip of that cone does not show up on the colored part of the graph. What we're, what we're trying to, to uh, show there is there's really no way to get to a, a perfect known number to say I know exactly what my budget costs are going to be um, because of volumetric variance, for instance. Or even with the utility, people thought, yeah, I have a fixed price because I'm on the utility tariff. Well, there's always change in law uh, or, or change in tariff that comes along with utilities or even a supplier. Uh, could implement change in law if those costs were to change. So from a product perspective, if uh, you could click the next button just once, advance, uh, you should see, and my screen is not working, you should see uh, uh, pop up to show little risk tolerance uh, on, on the left side of the screen. So if you select, uh, if you know, customer looking for a very narrow uh, band of outcomes, a lot of price certainty uh, would go to the left side of the screen. Um, uh, advancing the slide again, we should see a, a, a box pop up at the right end of the screen showing customers who are very risk tolerant. Uh, on the left part of the screen, you know, the, the, the narrow range of outcomes, I tend to see customers like uh, school districts and apartment buildings and, and real estate where they've got a fixed stream of income. The school can't easily increase the tax rates to be able to cover a slight increase in power costs. And a landlord with fixed, uh, you know, fixed leases uh, that include electricity can't easily raise those, those leases. So they, uh, they're you know, typically looking for more, secure, uh, more security in their budget. The right end of that spectrum, um, we see uh, companies like steel mills and chemical plants that may have a very easy uh, way to pass through costs to their customers. Oil refineries can raise the cost of gas at the pump to cover uh, to cover swings in, in, in load, so or swings in, in price rather, so they can uh, they can be much more 
tolerant of volatility and tend not to then want to pay risk premiums on top of that to suppliers to, to fix up and, and get themselves more electricity certainty. And then uh, advancing one more time, we should see a box show up in the middle here that shows uh, kind of a middle ground where a lot of customers will, will reside with uh, more risk tolerances and good products for customers like this would be things like lock and index or fixed prices with uh, some pass-throughs like capacity and transmission. Um, moving to the next slide, uh, again, we get back to the pyramid. Uh, the, the big part of that, that pyramid is uh, the, the, the costs here are hedgeable. Um, I think if you click once, we should see the hedgeable come up there. Uh, because the, the, that's the energy portion, we can hedge the energy and, and lock in those prices based on, on futures and forwards and, and, and cover that risk. Uh, next, the top part is, again, not hedgeable. These are, are tariff costs, and we can't go to a Wall Street or a bank and, and get a hedge for a transmission tariff. It just doesn't happen. So we're at risk for those costs, and to fix those in, in, in um, to fix those with a customer, um, we need to, uh, you know, we would need to put on risk premiums, as, as I discussed before. So um, that that ends up uh, add, adding to costs. So um, moving on to the right part of the screen, now we can convert that into energy uh, product structures. Uh, the the energy structure can be fixed. It can be uh, indexed with uh, with an adder onto the index, and that index could include just our, our fees, uh, or it could also include some of the things from the top, those those uh, uh, delivery type components, um, and then either either index to a, a real time product or a day ahead product, and then to get more price certainty, customers can lock in fixed blocks. Um, Another alternative on the energy structure is also going with a heat rate product, uh, which uh, we're one of the few suppliers uh, outside of Texas that offers heat rate. And in these markets, uh, uh, what we could do on a heat rate product is index a customer to natural gas as opposed to indexing them to uh, uh, indexing them to uh, to the the, uh, the power markets. Then looking at the top part of that graph, or the top part of that box, uh, we can include or pass through costs like capacity, transmission, ancillaries, and, and line losses. But locking these in with the supplier ends up uh, moving the, the risk to that supplier, which uh, which then results in uh, in some risk premiums being applied. Um, just a note here on capacity and, and locking in capacity. Given the fact that uh, there's still some uncertainty in the implementation of the, the new capacity markets in Ameren, uh, at this point, uh, we're, we're only locking capacity prices or fixing capacity prices through uh, through May of 2013. Uh, we do expect, though, in the new year, once uh, once the obligations have been released and we know more certainty about how, how the market uh, will finally be functioning, we do anticipate being able to fix, uh, fix capacity going into the future. And as Karen said a minute ago, uh, Given the fact that there will, there will be still this bilateral capacity market available in, in uh, Midwest ISO, we anticipate being able to, uh, to, to put on hedges for a longer term uh, than just the prompt year. And this is actually kind of a unique aspect of, of this MISO capacity construct that we don't see in places like PJM that also have a capacity construct uh, where you know, there's not an active bilateral market and uh, uh, the suppliers are basically just pricing in the uh, the prices that were uh, that were set via the auction that uh, that the ISO runs. So in this case, really the auction is going to set kind of a default rate uh, for the short term for the prompt uh, planning year, but we'll be able to do bilateral hedging to to cover longer periods of time than that. So I think that's going to make some interesting product uh, uh, possibilities in in Ameren going forward. Uh, going to the next slide, just a brief uh, another item here about uh, one of the pricing structures that, that we've seen to be seen pretty popular in, in, in Amber, and that's going with variable pricing, indexing to to LMP, but then locking in fixed uh, fixed blocks. <coughs> um, I'll hurry through the slides so we've got time for questions because uh, I see a lot of questions are coming in. Uh, but you know, a benefit on this is, is you can take advantage of some of those very low energy prices we're seeing in, in the in the day ahead and real time markets but still be able to lock in and fix uh, portions of that load forward if, uh, if customers see, uh, see good opportunities. So we like to work with customers who are on this product to design uh, hedge strategies uh, 
uh, around uh, around their load and uh, help help them watch the market and, and determine at what point they may want to uh, hedge if the price gets low enough or even hedge because the price is going up in the forward market and wanting to protect themselves from from uh, continued run up in, in the cost. So it gives a lot of flexibility to uh, to customers. You also avoid going out on, on a fixed price and saying, uh, you know, I'm doing my RFP next Thursday, and I think that's going to be the best day for the next three years to buy power. Well, it never is. So uh, an opportunity on or a product like a block and index strategy helps customers to build up a portfolio of hedges over time and take advantage of, of price movements in, in the market and not just uh, ho hope that the day that they're running their RFP is going to be the best one because that, that just opens you up to second-guessing from the boss at the end of the day. So we... Uh, Definitely uh, think this is a pretty good product, especially for larger customers, and uh, we'd love to talk to you about, uh, about that opportunity. Moving to the last page here, just some conclusions on product. Uh, we still see fixed pricing is, is very suitable for many customers, especially those that need, uh, that need more price certainty, and we'd be happy to sit down with, with any of you and talk about that risk-reward spectrum to understand what really the best, uh, the best situation might be for you. Uh, but some, especially larger customers, could, should be considering some of the more sophisticated products like the block and index product or a heat rate uh, to take advantage of uh, energy prices that we think will remain stable uh, for a long period of time because of things like uh, the shale gas play, et cetera. So um, at the end of the day, Illinois, especially Ameren, continues to be very competitive, so make sure you're getting uh, offers from a lot of different suppliers and, and getting a good look at that market. Uh, going to the last slide before our questions, just one last uh, one last plug here for for GDF Suez. Um, this slide, a couple of things I just want to uh, highlight. Um, we thank you for your attendance today. But uh, financial stability is one of the, the big things that we like to talk about at at, at our company. Uh, this company has been in existence since 1822. It is uh, the parent company is the company that dug the Suez Canal. Uh, it's so what what that gives you the, the longevity of the corporation along with that A credit rating and very uh, uh, conservative financial uh, uh, approach to the business is certainty. Uh, you know that the contracts that we write, we're going to be, we're going to be here in the long run to, uh, uh, to deliver on those contracts and, uh, and, and be here to serve our customers. Uh, we're also highly regarded for our service, uh, both uh, uh, before and after, after the sale, and providing uh, options like uh, uh, a billing portal to be able to view your details on your invoice, uh, and market monitor and price watch uh, uh, devices that uh, give customers updates on pricing, uh, and even the, the price watch is a, a customized uh, uh, price uh, function that our salespeople can use and, and send out price updates to customers on a on a, on a periodic basis uh, to help them watch the market. So. We appreciate uh, you listening today and joining us for this webinar. Uh, we're now going to turn to the, uh, the Q&A. And again, if you have questions, please submit them through the, uh, uh, through the panel on, on your screen. And uh, we'll begin to, uh, to answer some of those questions uh, right now. So some of the, uh, we've got questions on the screen. I'll, I'll answer some of them, but I, I may turn to Scott or Karen to, uh, uh, to help answer some of uh, some of these questions, so uh, a couple of things that, that have come in. Uh, first one from uh, from Eric Hager at uh, at Cargill. Hello, Eric. Uh, thank you for joining. Good to see you. Uh, what is the straddle? Uh, we talked as part of the energy part of the presentation about the straddle costs. Uh, when we do a fixed price product, uh, typically those products are banded or have some kind of a material adverse change clause on them. Uh, and we, we buy uh, a, a derivative called a, called a straddle, which is uh, a price in a derivative called a straddle, which is uh, put in a call uh, around that product so that if, or on, around the consumption band level, so that if uh, consumption varies, and typically on a banded contract, we've got a, a consumption band of something like 10%. So what we're saying is that our fixed price is fixed. Uh, for the expected usage, and the customer can vary on that usage on a monthly basis within plus or minus 10%. But outside of that band, uh, we would settle a customer against the, uh, uh, the uh, hourly uh, real-time price 
uh, no penalty there, just settling against the real-time price. So we, we buy a straddle to, uh, to protect our, our price position inside that bandwidth. And so we do that not just for the banded products, but for, for really any of our products where we're, uh, we're giving customers either uh, some kind of swing against their expected volume. So that's, that's what we mean by the straddle, and it's, it's priced into our energy on fixed price uh, products. It doesn't get priced in on an index contract because in those cases – uh, the customer is really uh, paying the hourly price on, on their actual volume, so any deviations around the actual volume on an hourly basis are, are simply priced at, at the L&P prices. Next question comes from James Wall at Chicago Power Company, and the question is, how is capacity measured in Ameren? Uh, Karen, do you want to try to take a cut at that one? Sure. I, I guess I'm not exactly sure the, the direction of the question, but the actual capacity supplied by the generation is, you know, for a given unit is the, the generator's operating capacity, and then it's lowered by uh, a forced outage rate. And what Ameren, well, that, that's all over MISO, and then Ameren for the, the retail side, your capacity will be based on your contribution to Ameren's peak for, for last summer, this past summer, for next year. Um, so when they run the auction, MISO will procure the exact amount of capacity to, to satisfy the total demand in the load forecast of Ameren. So hopefully that, that clears up. Yeah, let me, let me try to jump in on some of that too. Um, Karen, uh, you know, in, in – PJM, for instance, the capacity uh, PLC that mm -hmm. customers can charge for for their capacity piece is based on the average of the five high, what the customer was using in the five highest hours the previous summer. It, does MISO have a similar five CP model, or are they going with a, a single CP, uh, CP meaning coincident uh, period? Right. Right now, Ameren is only going to use a single uh, CP. It's just the highest um, demand hour in Ameren. They, Ameren says they're not against using a, a three or five CP approach, but at the moment they, they don't have the resources, um, the technological uh, resources to accomplish that kind of task. So it's just Ameren's peak hour for the, the previous year. Yeah, so from a customer perspective, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the obligation or the PLC is going to be set based on whatever that customer's meter read in that single hour that Ameren peaked for the year. Uh, so that typically won't mean it's the customer's absolute highest hour, uh, especially on, on manufacturing customers where they, they've got probably some more diversity. Um, so it, it, for, for a weather-dependent customer, that could be the same hour that they peaked for the year, but it may not be. I think typically we'll see probably uh, PLC is a little bit lower than the peak demand uh, or the peak billing demand that uh, – a customer might see for the month or for the year from their Ameren distribution bill. Right, so and at, at the, right now the the PLCs have been provided by Ameren to the supplier. So if you have questions on what your PLC might be, you can reach out to your supplier, and they should be able to provide that data as of Good. today. Great. Um, Andrew Phillips uh, asked, asked the next question from RGO Capital, LLC. Uh, thanks for joining, Andrew. Um, Andrew asks, how does a merchant coal facility make any money with average per megawatt hour prices of $31 a megawatt hour in MISO? Uh, and that's, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, and I think that is, that is contributing to a lot of the retirements that we've seen in PJM. I don't think we've seen as many in, in, in Midwest ISO yet. But, uh, yeah, that is a problem. And, and some of that stems from the very low cost of natural gas uh, that's been driven down by uh, the shale gas plays in the Utica shale in Ohio and the Marcellus shale in, in, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, as well as some of the shale plays down in Texas. So we're awash in gas right now, and that's, that's driven down, as you saw on the slide earlier, driven down both the gas prices and, and then the power prices uh, followed. What we've actually seen is, uh, and, and if you watched uh, Andy Weitzman's uh, presentation on our webinar back in, uh, I think it was in September, our third quarter uh, national webinar, uh, he talked about how the 
dispatch stack has changed and how we're, all the gas units used to be dispatched at a price well above coal, with the decrease, with a significant decrease in, in gas pricing, we're seeing uh, a lot more of the gas plants, especially the, uh, the combined cycle plants, being dispatched before coal plants. And so, yeah, we're seeing a lot of coal being idled. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen anything uh, specifically about, about any units in, in Ameren's territory, but I'm sure it's happening there. But, for instance, uh, I have seen uh, First Energy uh, in Ohio has moved some of its uh, traditionally base load generating stations, some of the big coal, into a cycling mode where they're only they're, they're going on to hot dispatch and uh, and not not the base load that they used to be at because gas is being is, is coming in at a lower price. So we're seeing some very large traditional uh, uh, tr traditional uh, base load units that are having to move into into more of a cycling, more of a peaking type type of mode because of the gas prices. It, it, it is very true, and it's. It's impacting on, uh, I think, on the earnings for a lot of the generating generating companies, um, and it's 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 really going to have some impact, I think, as, as uh, gas continues to remain uh, very cheap. Um, so I think that that's going to affect both the merchant plants as well as uh, as well as regulated plants. Although the regulated plants still do have coverage from. Uh, from the tariffs and, and, and you know, if it's a regulated plant that's tied to a vertically integrated utility, then you know, they're still probably going to dispatch their own units before going to market power. But I think we'll eventually see, begin to see uh, even vertically integrated uh, tariffed uh, uh, cost-based units having to, uh, having to be moved to different statuses as well. Um, Brad Engel from Air Liquide asks, how much is the SSR charge per kilowatt hour? Um, Eric, that, the SSR charge varies by instance and, and even can vary by month. Uh, I'm not sure what the units uh, up in Escanaba, what, what that's resulted in. Karen, I don't know if you have that, that number or not. No, I, I don't have the number. It was just established as a, an SSR unit last uh, last month, um, okay. and we we don't see the settlement data for that that unit. Yeah, in fact, it, it, you know that that's a good point. These these are not like tariff numbers that we can go look at a tariff that that the ISO or the utility publishes. Uh, we end up seeing the actual SSR charge, or in the case of PJM, the uh, the RMR charge come through on our ancillary settlement statement each month. And uh, that, that's why it becomes relatively unpredictable. Uh, in, in the case of that Philadelphia instance uh, last year, uh, we knew it started in, in June. We knew about what it was, but it was a couple of months before we saw what, what they actually were. Uh, those units remained on, uh, on RMR uh, for a little over a year uh, and came off of RMR last, uh, this past June 2012. But we continue to see some settlements coming through from PJM three months later, even four months later, going back in time and, and billing us additional uh, RMR charges uh, retroactively. So it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to, to put a number on, and we've seen them vary from uh, just, uh, just a couple of pennies or 20 cents a megawatt hour up to $1.75 in the case of the, uh, the Philadelphia units. And even going back about uh, seven years up in, up in Boston, there was about a $10 a megawatt hour, so a full penny a kilowatt hour uh, uh, generation deactivation charge that was on for a period of time. So it's a very volatile number and something that, uh, frankly, we don't, we don't have good insight on until we actually see the invoice come in, which is why we don't attempt to try to fix that, uh, that cost, and we'll just pass through what the actual is that, that we get invoiced. Um, next question... Uh, Jim Laird, continuing on the, the questions about SSR, explain the logic behind SSR charges when customers are able to fix a price from another generator, i.e. no obligation to the retiring coal plant. It's not an issue of, of uh, uh, commitment to one unit or another. In fact, if you're buying supply from a, from a third-party supplier, that's typically not a unit contingent contract. I see very few unit contingent contracts where you can say, I'm buying power from that generator over there. Uh, but rather, this, this is a market-based charge for reliability. Uh, the reason for the charge is 
the you know the the, the generation owner has uh, determined that the unit's no longer economic to run, or they don't want to make an investment to keep it running, and they petition to the ISO and to FERC for permission to retire the unit, and then the ISO's engineers get to work on modeling the transmission area and the load uh, and generation in, in in that zone to determine whether taking that unit offline is going to affect reliability. And if they find that in some circumstances or in all circumstances that that generation is needed for reliability, uh, they'll, they'll move to design a, or propose transmission upgrades in the area to bring in more power to, to replace the generation locally. Uh, and then until, but until that new transmission is constructed and in service, uh, they order the unit to continue to run. And so as a result, you have a generating company who's been ordered to run a unit that's uneconomic. And so what they're saying is it's cost them more to generate the power than they're going to earn. And so that difference becomes this SSR payment. And they, they petition to FERC and to the ISO to, to, uh, to be allowed to collect an SSR payment on that. So that, that's the reason for it. It's, it's a matter of grid reliability, and, and that's why it's not part of energy, but rather part of the ancillary services. Uh, Karen, anything to add on that? No, that, that's pretty good. One, one thing, though, is um, even though the contract was published and sent to FERC in October, kind of what you said in, in PJM applies here, that Escanaba contract, MISA was requesting that the the charges be recurred, recouped back to June 1st. So similar things have popped up in MISO as, as in PJM. Okay, great. Okay. Um, uh, last two questions. Uh, so we're beginning to run out of time here. Uh, Art, is it Art Stoley? Art Stoley. Art Stoley from uh, NASCO uh, Industries. Do you have any estimates as uh, I'm sorry, as, uh, on what you think capacity cost will be in the outer years. Uh, Karen, I think we've got some indication of that. Do you want to talk about that, capacity cost yeah. in the outer years and why so? We, we do have a, a little bit of uh, clarity into what capacity might cost in the, the outer years. Right now, capacity is extremely cheap in MISO, I mean, around a penny or two, um, and the, the monthly auction is clear at, at almost nothing. In, in the future, uh, although the the bilateral prices seem, you know, reasonably cheap, um, I'd say for the next year it might be around five or ten cents, and then two years out, um, somewhere around thirty cents. But but in the the MISO right now doesn't see foresee the the resource planning auction um, clearing very high either. So right now, even though MISO you know thirty cents might be pretty cheap, it's still a, a large premium to to what we uh, in MISO these days. Okay. Good. Um, Robert Warner.